Hello, Morim here. In today's video, I will be sharing my Beastmaster Ranger build in Baldur's Gate 3. The focus on this build was to make sure to utilize the companion provided to us. There are multiple ways to do this, but I thought integrating the Sentinel feature was the best option. Whenever our friend is attacked, we get to react with a protective counter. Now, this build is also more about flavor. I specifically focused around functionality throughout the whole game, which is provided to us with a ton of options to make encounters engaging. Beastmasters can summon a pet once per short rest, which increases in power at ranger level 5, 8 and 11. Those can be a bear, a spider or a wolf, all of which have unique toolkits. Since we want to focus on utilizing those beasts the best way we can, we only have one level to multiclass with. This however is not a problem. A war cleric lets us use a bonus action as a regular attack and it also works on range attacks, so we kind of get access to free attacks. But we also get additional attacks and utility from our trusty friend. And we are also only going to use a one-handed weapon since we want to have a free hand to pet our companion. Now with the introduction of the build out of the way, let's have a look at the starting ability score as well as level progression. So we are going to obviously start with a ranger. So for the ability score we pick 12 strength, 16 dexterity, 16 constitution, 8 intelligence, 14 wisdom and 8 charisma. We could potentially dump our strength score, however the jump action is extremely good and going with 8 strength is not a pleasant experience, especially on a melee build. Yes, we do have a bow, but we want to be close and personal with our pets. For the favored enemy, we pick up the bounty hunter. We get proficiency in investigation and we get to debuff enemies with our ensnaring strike. Since we are a dex build, we also want to have proficiency in sleight of hand if we do not have a rogue or a bard that is proficient and an expert in that skill. Otherwise, I can recommend going with Wasteland Wanderer Fire to get fire resistance. There is a ton of fire damage early on, so having that one will make the early game much smoother. The next level is going to be a ranger. Some builds might recommend going with the cleric at level 2. However, there is a bug. If you do not reach the extra attack before you multiclass into the war cleric, your bonus action is going to be used before your extra attack. So the order is attack, bonus action, then attack. If you do not want to use your bonus action, you cannot choose that if you pick the war cleric right now. It is a known bug, it is low priority, so it's probably not going to be fixed in the near future. So we are going to rush level 5 with the ranger. At level 2 we pick dueling. So we want to have a dexterity weapon in our main hand and no offhand, no shield and no second weapon. Yes, we could potentially go with two weapon fighting and this build supports that if you prefer that. But like I said, I want to focus on dueling. This is to do with the legendary weapon we get, giving us massive boni if we are dueling. For the spells, we are going to pick Ensnaring Strike as well as Hunter's Mark. Some utility options to make your party a little bit more mobile is Enhanced Leap as well as Long Strider. You can also pick Speak with Animals. Enhanced Leap, Long Strider and Speak with Animals can be cast as a ritual spell without expanding the spell slot. At level 3 we are going with the Beastmaster specialization. First for the spell, just thinking about flavor, Speak with Animals makes the most sense. So we picked that. Now the Beastmaster subclass is going to give us Ranger's Companion, which lets us summon a beast. The companions available to you are a bear, a boar, a wolf spider, a dire raven, and a wolf. At level 4, another level in Ranger. For the feat, the most optimal option would be going with the ability score improvement. If you get the hack hair, so a little bit of hair from a hack, you can encounter in Act 1. You can improve one ability score of any companion you like by one. This means we could possibly respec our dexterity to 17, eat that hair, get the ability score improvement, and now have 20 dexterity. There is however better options to feed that hair. You can only do this for one character. So we are not going with the ability score improvement. Instead, we are going with the sentinel feed. The sentinel feed will make it possible to react with an attack of opportunity when a nearby ally is getting attacked. Our companions count as allies. And our opportunity attacks get advantage. And there is another bonus, sentinel snare. Our attacks of opportunity snare targets if we hit them. This means Early game, I would highly recommend going with the bear companion because of its scouting raw ability. When we summon this bear, it is able to taunt enemies around it. This will make them attack this bear, which will trigger our attacks of opportunity. The bear is also quite tanky and deals quite a lot of damage, so it's a good option to have. But I will show you the companions and its abilities at the end. At level 5, another level in ranger. This gives us access to extra attack. Our pets do not get this bonus, 
However, Companions Bond will give our proficiency bonus added to their armor class and damage rolls, which is quite amazing. This means the more decks we have, the tankier and more damaging our pets become. As for the spell, we want Pass Without Trace. Our companions also get a massive boost to health at level 5, more than double, and they get a really nifty helmet. Additionally, they get a special ability. This is not their ultimate ability, just something on top. The summon does not state that, so you need to look at every single pet individually. At level 6, we are going to pick up one level in Cleric, specifically the War Domain. This allows us to use our bonus action by spending a War Priest charge as a normal attack. This counts for melee attacks and for range attacks. The best count trips are going to be Sacred Flame, Guidance and Blade Ward. For the deity, Mieliki is the most fitting one. It's the goddess of forests and creatures. As for the spells, Sanctuary is nice to protect our ally, our companion if things get dicey. We can use Command as a non-concentration CC ability and we can also use Bless instead of our Hunter's Mark to buff our allies and ourselves. All other levels are going to be Ranger levels. For the favored enemy, we can go with Ranger Knight. This allows us to use heavy armor and we get skill proficiency in history. As for the natural explorer, we pick up the poison resistance. At level 7 you are going to encounter quite a lot of enemies that dish out poison damage. So having that resistance to poison damage is going to come in very handy. Level 7 in Ranger is going to give us a spell, which we are going to use to pick up Long Strider or Enhanced Leap as our ritual spell. All other options are not that great. Enhanced Leap is really great, especially when you do not have a dedicated caster with the spell, so we are going to pick that now. As for the class feature, we get exceptional training. Our pet can now dash, disengage or help as a bonus action. We are character level 8, but only ranger level 7. This means our pet is not going to increase in strength. For this we need to level one more level in the ranger. Our feat is going to be the ability score improvement. As mentioned before, with the hacker you now have 20 dexterity, but 18 is also really good. With that level, our pet is going to level up. This pet does not get any benefits at this level, just a health increase and a stat bonus. At level 9 we get access to level 3 spells. Some builds will recommend you to go with the lightning arrow. However, this one is based on our wisdom casting modifier, which is only plus 2. We have no gear to boost this, so this one is going to never hit. Absolutely never. Dealing half damage with the lightning arrow is 3 to 24. It can be good, but I would much rather attack with my regular attacks and with a lightning arrow I have stored in my inventory than with this spell. So the best option is daylight. The next level is going to be another ranger level. For the favored enemy we are going with sanctified stalker. And for the natural explorer, wanderer fire is going to be really nice. There's quite a few enemies with fire and poison damage in act 3, so having that one is going to be really nice. And the last level is going to be a ranger level. Our pet gets now an extra attack. We do not. However, we have our free attacks anyway with our bonus attack. At this level, you are also going to have the legendary weapon, so you actually do not need the warp priest charges anymore to attack with a bonus action. However, our range attacks still benefit from those charges, and we benefited through those charges until this level. Technically, you can respec and pick another level in the ranger. I however feel like that extra attack on that ranged option is still going to benefit us greatly. This doesn't mean it's not an option because you get another feat and you can increase your ability score, so the dexterity to 20 and benefit through that, but some of you don't want to respec, so weigh in that option. As for the spell, plant growth as a CC ability without concentration is going to be quite amazing. At level 11 with our ranger, our bear is also going to level up. The helmet is looking quite swag, so that's really nice to have. And the ability to summon another bear is going to unlock, which is a level 7 with a minor. It has Golding Raw and Honeyed Paws. Quite nice to have. Another body on the field, you don't even need to control it. So I will quickly go through the abilities. Honeyed Paws, which is gained at level 5, is basically a disarm ability. If the target does not hold a weapon, it prones the target, if it fails a strength saving throw. Golding Raw is an ability to AoE taunt every single enemy inside the radius, which combos nicely with the Sentinel perk. The summon cannot be controlled by you and can also taunt and can also use Honeyed Paws. The pet can also be dissummoned. However, the automatically summoned pet will stay on the battlefield. You can now short rest and summon another companion. This will not dismiss the bear, so you will keep the bear 
that summoned by a bear. For the ball, regular attack, 1d6 plus 2. So like I said, it only has 15 strength, so only a plus 2 to damage. It can kick up muck, so it slows enemies. It can charge forward, which deals basically no damage. It can rage, which is basically the regular rage of a barbarian. Plus 2 slashing damage, resistance to physical, and advantage to strength checks and saving throws. And they get access to Frenzied Strike. Frenzied Strike deals 1d6 plus 2 slashing damage as a bonus action. So we can attack 3 times with this specific companion. However, like I said, the damage is really low because of the stats. A long rest will unsummon all your pets. So the next one is going to be the Wolf Spider Companion. We can summon this one to get a spider just without a helmet. It looks pretty cool. Has 60 health, so it's quite tanky. Not amazing, but it's okay. Deals 1d8 plus 4 piercing damage and poisons targets. Has the web action, which is a huge AoE to end web targets. And web prevents them from moving and attack rolls against them have advantage, as well as some other boni. You can also cocoon a target, which is a melee action. Cocooning basically traps them, it's like whole person. And we have Bursting Brute. Bursting Brute deals 2d10 piercing damage. So when we attack a target, it infests them. The damage of this one has the plus 4 damage we are provided with through our boni we get at level, I think, 7. So it's 2d10 plus 4 damage because our proficiency modifier is 4. The attack roll here is also plus 4, plus 1 strength modifier. And the infest also deals quite a lot of damage. It's 1d4 poison damage and 1d4 piercing damage. This can spread on multiple targets, and ourselves, we cannot be infected. It technically doesn't have an end duration because it stays on the target until a long rest. However, every single turn is going to roll a saving throw, and if that saving throw succeeds, infested is going to disappear from the target. Now, getting infested on a target is going to deal a lot of damage. It's 1d4 and 1d4 plus 2 times your proficiency modifier. So this ability is going to deal an insane amount of damage, and this one is also ranged. So for damage, this pet seems like the best option. Keep in mind, that's the ultimate ability. The next pet is the Dire Raven. It's an amazing raven with blue wings and a really nice helmet. It is squishy, only has 44 HP, but deals a lot of damage. It's 2d4 plus 1d6 plus 2. We also get Rent Vision, which is 2d6 plus 2, and the target is blinded. We get Bad Omen, which is 2d8 piercing damage, plus it marks targets with the curse status, which can be used once per turn, and it gives advantage on any attacks made against the target. Basically, it provides you with advantage. And we have a summon. We summon two ravens, additionally to the one we have. Those cannot be controlled, and they only have 13 health. They can rend vision, and they can big attack. When we dissummon this pet, the ravens stay, just as with the bear. A short rest does not dissummon them, and we can now summon the wolf. The wolf has 91 HP, deals necrotic damage with the infectious bite, so 2d4 plus 4 necrotic damage, and it applies possibly the septic status. Constitution is reduced by 1, and they have disadvantage on constitution saving throws. We get the bite action, which is 2d4 plus 4 piercing damage, and we get Lunging Bite, so it knocks enemies prone. The ultimate ability is Lupine Slash. 2d6 plus 6 force damage. It uses a cone ability to summon a Spectral Sword and do a really cool move. So each ability has a lot of style. I personally cannot pick a favorite here. All of them are useful and very strong. Now as for the early gameplay, you want to cast Hunter's Mark on a target which now gets dealt an additional 1d6 piercing damage, which is based on the ranged weapon we have equipped. So if you have the near missile in your offhand, this one will deal force damage. To show you this, Hunter's Mark now deals force damage. We can use Ensnaring Strike as a ranged or a melee option, and it will ensnare the target on a failed saving throw. Doesn't deal a lot of damage, but every turn of the Ensnaring Strike, so every ensnared, is going to deal additional piercing damage based on the Hunter's Mark. So it's basically a dot we apply to the target. It's a really strong ability. This piercing damage is not affected by anything, so I haven't found a damage rider that applies to this one. And for utility, you can use a ton of arrows you can find throughout the game. And for buffing, you can pre-buff your enhanced sleep, doesn't expand a spell slot. You can use your daylight, which expands a spell slot. 
However, this one really shines bright throughout your whole adventure. It never falls off. It's not the concentration spell. This makes it possible to use a concentration spells like Hunter's Mark, Bless, Shield of Faith, or Pass Without a Trace. Now let's talk about gear. One possibility is the Dancing Breeze if you want to go with a two-handed approach and do not want to just one-hand a one-hander. It gives you the ability Whirlwind Attack. However, it's only one time per short rest, so after this it's a plus two weapon. Basically disappointing. It is a finesse weapon with extra reach, however I personally didn't like it, so I opted for the one-handed playstyle. You can find a lot of really nice dexterity weapons, so those have the finesse tag. For example, the Knife of the Undermountain King, which can be found at the Quartermaster in Crash Yelek. You can find the Rapier Plus One down in the Goblin Village, the Raided One, down where the Forge is. So in the cellar there is a chest with one inside, so there is a ton of options. Your hit chance is going to be a little bit lower, so keep that in mind. Try to get advantage wherever you can, be it through your buffs, be it through Bless, be it through allies. You can also use the Risky Ring to get advantage on attacks, however we cannot offset the disadvantage on saving throw, so that's not a good fit. You will get CC'd and pushed around quite a lot. Do not enjoy the Risky Ring approach. Especially in Act 2 there is quite a lot of CC and I found myself lacking in that regard. And there is also a ton of arrows, like the Arrow of Lightning, Arrow of Fire, Arrow of Ice, Arrows of Aberration Slaying. There is a ton of options here and you can pick every single one and throw them at your enemies. The next item that's going to be progression based is going to be your armor. We want medium armor that's not locked. This means we are looking at armor like this. UNT scale mail or later armor of agility. Those add your whole dexterity modifier to your armor class and are not gated by just two. So this one is at the quartermaster vendor in last light in and this one can be found in the moonrise tower at one of the vendors. During Act 1 there is not many items you can find that improve your defense as much. In the Goblin Camp you can find Hide Armor plus 2, so that's gated to 14 plus 2, but it's better than nothing. Now let's talk about the most optimal endgame gear. Specifically the Duelist Prerogative. This one is a ton of fun to use. If your offhand is empty, you critically hit on a 19 or more. And you get an additional reaction. Remember we are using Sentinel, so this one fits perfectly. On a hit we can also use a reaction to add our proficiency bonus as a necrotic damage. However, that's only four, so the additional attack per round is going to be better. We can then also use Dueler's Enthusiasm. This one is per turn. You can use a bonus action to strike again, so basically a third attack. And we also get Challenge to a Duel. You can force the target to attack only you and they are going to be bleeding. Overall, a very strong weapon, very flavorful and very fitting for the build. Now, how do you obtain this one? You can start a quest right here in the Basilisk Gate Barracks in Act 3, here. Follow this quest line, which will lead you down to the Old Gallows place. Complete this side quest and craft the Hag's Bane. You need to throw this Hag's Bane at the Hag at the end of the quest line you received right here at the Basilisk Gate. Otherwise, you are not going to receive this weapon. So make sure to do the Old Gallows place and then do this quest line. For the bow, the Hatchet Bow is the most fitting one. We increase our critical strike chance even more and we get a double to our proficiency bonus modifier on range attacks. This weapon can be found at the vendor right here at the Stormshore Armory. Next we are going to have a look at the Strange Conduit Ring. This one can be acquired in Act 1. When you progress through the Crash Yelek, you will find this ring. This can be on one of the corpses left behind after the fight or in a chest, so make sure to loot that place. Then you have Caustic Band, which can be bought from the vendor Derith. Derith can be found in Act 1 in the Spore Colony, down in the Underdark or in Act 3 right here in the shop, Bone Cloak's Apothecary. You can buy it either then or now. It basically just adds to acid damage. The Surgeon's Subjugation Amulet can be used to paralyze the target after scoring a critical hit. It needs to be humanoid. This one can be found in the House of Feeling in Act 2. The Severox Horned Helmet increases our critical strike chance even more, can be found by following the Murder Quest line in Act 3 right in this zone. Then we have the Cloak of Displacement, this one is for sale in Act 3, can be found in the span of Worm Crossing, right before Worm Rocks there is a shop on the left side, the vendor there sells it. Armor of Agility can be found at this vendor here, Stormshore Armory, Boots of Persistence can be found at Demon, at the Forge of Nine right here, so if you have killed him you will not have access to those boots, but the freedom of movement is really nice to have, so you want to exchange the Caustic Band for the Ring of reaction right here. It basically provides you with the same effect as the boots, just a little bit worse, can be found at the alchemist vendor in Moonrise Tower in Act 2. 
And for the boot, Legacy of the Masters gives you a plus two to attacks and a plus two to attack rolls, which can also be found at the Forge of Nine at Demons. If you do not have those gloves, anything will do. It is not required. Anything that increases your attack chance is going to be huge because we do not have full dexterity. So gloves of dexterity that have 18 dexterity can be good on this build. However, we are stacking dexterity anyway, so that's not going to be the best. It will, however, help you offset the attack modifier here. The Flawed Helder's Gloss will provide you with a 1d4 fire damage to your attacks, which can be beneficial. And there is also Swordmaster Gloss, which can be found in Act 2 at Daemons. Anyway, this sums up the build guide. If you liked this video, please make sure to leave a like. Comment down below if you have any questions or remarks. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And you can join the channel membership or leave a donation if you have the spare coin. So, see you next time and bye.